ES Audio. The Evening Standard Rugby Podcast with Lawrence Delalio, supported by Fuller's London Pride, official beer of Premiership Rugby. Support with pride. Hello, I'm Lawrence Delalio. Welcome to the Evening Standard Rugby Podcast, supported by Fuller's London Pride. As ever, I have my wonderful co-host. Actually, she's more like the presenter, to be honest. Sarah Elgin is with us. Sarah, how are you? I'm good, Lawrence. How are you? Very well. I'm not sure why I brought glasses on, because I don't need them to see you. I know you look like very studious. I'm not used to seeing you looking bright. Okay, also joining us, we're delighted to welcome on board the new rugby correspondent from the Evening Standard. It's Nick Prewell. Hi, Nick. Hi, Sarah. How are you? Nick, to have you on. Looking very studious as well. I actually can't see, so I need them. They're not for show. And our guest this week is a man who's made over 250 appearances for Harlequins. He has represented England 83 times and the British Irish Lions on their 2017 tour. He's a much-loved personality, both on and off the pitch. It's Joe Marler. Hi, Joe. Hello. I don't think I've ever given you an intro like that before. That was really nice, wasn't it? It was still really insincere. <laughs> Um, but I'll take it, whatever. I'll take I forgot it to a... add. I forgot to add. Very entertaining post-match interviewee. Well, is that really something to shout about? No, not really. Um, Lul, what's the crap with the glasses, mate? Is it like Ugo who just wears the fake glasses for fashion, or have you now hit the age that you got bad eyes? I'm fifty. Uh, you wouldn't believe it, but I have turned fifty. Ugo must be in his thirties. I need the bins now. I'm told I look like Harry Hill. I was thinking more sort of brick top from Snatch or something, but it's, it's Harry Hill, I think. Do you know what nemesis means? <laughs> you don't want to be counting the fingers you haven't got. There we go. How was the Barbarians? You've had a, a sort of a nice week, haven't you, really, of just, you know, getting together, having a crack, maybe only two or three training sessions, if that. Well, have you done the bar bars? I have, yeah, but I'll never forget it, actually, because we trained at Chelsea, and Mike Ruddock had just been appointed the coach, and he just lost his job with Wales, and he was obviously a bit overexcited, and uh, started laying out line-out cones, and the lad said to me, what's he doing? I said, what do you mean, what's he doing? And he said, well, he looks like he's laying out cones for a training session. So they said, well, go and have a word with him. I remember going, I said to him, Mike, I know you're keen, but I'm very sorry, but we don't really do any training for this week. <laughs> That's <laughs> not how it works around here, Mike. You're, I appreciate yeah. you're still in, in real work mode, but we'll just put a couple of pods up. In fact, we won't put pods up. We'll just throw the ball in on the game day and see how it goes. Um, <laughs> it went well, didn't it? Well, you've experienced it yourself, mate, and it is up there with one of my favourite experiences to do in rugby. Especially now that I'm getting of that age where the professionalism is probably going to come to an end soon. It's nice to actually still make the most of these opportunities of meeting all different players from around the world, different coaches as well. I was really looking forward to actually seeing what Razor and, and Roger are about. You know, they're highly praised around the world, but it's it's just a different thing to actually see how they work. And Lawrence, how's your week been? Yeah, very good. Thank you. I You're in a better mood this week. Much happier this week. I was with the family end of last week and then I went to Twickenham, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Really enjoyed it, actually. And Nick, you were supposed to be interviewing um, Mako Vanapola, but uh, obviously uh, Eddie's decided that um, there's a media <laughs> shutdown, is there? No, 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 no. He just had more important things to do, which he can never argue with. So uh, we'll pick that up tomorrow. Excellent. Don't forget, you can also watch the full extended video podcast at londonpridebeer.co.uk. Please drink responsibly. Joe, it's great to have you with us. I think I read somewhere that when you joined Quinns, Colin Osborne, who was one of the great coaches at Quinns, paired you with uh, Jason Leonard. How was it with the big fella as your mentor? Yeah, I was 17 and Colin had arranged. He said, look, is Jason Leonard's number. Arrange it between yourself. He's, he knows it's coming and blah, blah. I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you, thank you. So I've texted him and said, oh, hello, Mr. Leonard if you can text in that voice, but that's exactly how the tone was of my text. <laughs> I've, I've been asked to arrange and come and meet with you. It's all right. And uh, the text about, yeah, mate, I'll be at the sun tomorrow night. Give us a shout and we'll catch up then. I was like, right, cool. So I found out where the sun was, got in there. There was quite a few people outside, walked in. There's rugby memorabilia all over the walls. There's quite a lot of him, actually. You can clearly see there was actually quite a bend in part of the bar that I was looking for the, a little tag that he was at. That's his bend where he's lent on it for so many years. And I said to the barman, I said, oh, is, um, is Mr. Leonard around? And he was like, uh, yeah, Why? And I was like, well, I just, I've, I've got a meeting with him. It's like, it's arranged. I'm going to, he's like, yeah, yeah, he was here. I think he might be outside or something. So I went outside and I found him half propped up against the car outside. And I said, oh, I, Jason, it's, um, it's Joe. Blah, blah. And he started swaying a bit. And clearly 
clearly, even though we'd arranged seven o'clock, he'd been there probably from about two. And uh, he said, nice to meet you, boy. He shook my hand. He said, do you mind if we rearrange this for another time? It's just I'm well on my way here. I was like, yeah, of course. Yeah, no, OK, I'll, I'll leave. Thank you. And then we re- arranged the following week a cup of coffee in Twickenham this time around. So, um, yeah, I felt very uh, privileged, actually. Someone that I'd grown up watching to then have a contact uh, on and off mentor. It's not one of those strict mentorships that's like I'll be nagging him all the time because clearly he doesn't want that. But it's good that Colin put me in contact to have over the years to to just sort of level me at some times and just tap his brains both about the stuff on the field and as much off of it to be honest joe talk me through the some of these track suits you've been wearing on the way to games i have to say I, that couldn't have been a, a little tip from jason because it, i mean he can't even fit in a track suit like that but um <laughs> is that is that just a little bit of you expressing yourself it started in lockdown when we were still playing through it and it soon became clear to me that I was struggling a bit with the fact there was no crowds. I'd gone a long period of my career not really appreciating the fans or it didn't sit comfortably either that, you know, people would want to ask for a photo or something. I was like, so I'd end up being quite rude. And I'm, I'm sure there's many a journalist that has been the back of that and appreciated that. And it was the same sort of vibe with fans as well, that I didn't really have that connection because I was like, no, it's weird. And also I'm just kind of doing it for the money. I'm doing it as a profession sort of thing. Lockdown two took that all away and it, it became soulless and I was really struggling to go up and get up for games even though I, was, I felt lucky that we were still able to keep playing and still trying to put some smiles on faces for people watching it on TV but I thought oh sod it I'll just start mixing it up a bit we were with Adidas at the time I thought they've got some decent gears they've got some decent retro gears Adidas are the nuts when it comes to it unfortunately I'd lost my Adidas sponsorship gig back in 2016 for certain on-field discrepancies um and so i bought one and it was fun and all the boys were like okay but so it gave me something a bit fun to do then it carried on and the boys would be like all oh, right well what we're we going to get next week something I you've got to be this you've got to try as outrageous as you can and some of them mate have cost me an arm and a leg they it look is- expensive they do look expensive there was a red one it was a ivy park it was beyonce collaboration with adidas and i had to lock it down really quick and that was the prices one going only for me to turn up at the stoop uh, for people to say that I look like, what are those things that you put in your cupboard and they're wrapped in red? Um, an immersion heater. They were like, you look like an immersion heater <laughs> walking into the thing. And I was like, I'm not, that wasn't the vibe I was going for, but it's fine. <laughs> uh, uh, but fortunately for me with that one, uh, because they were so limited edition, you can't get them anymore. I plan on keeping that for a little bit longer and then, hopefully selling it to someone that wants a 4XL tracksuit. <laughs> How much did that cost you then? That tracksuit in all, because I went to town, I went with the shoes, the socks, everything, that even the jacket. That was north of about 1,800 quid. Oh, my gosh, Joe. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we're um, just moving on. You've widely documented as um, in terms of the work that you've done with the mental health charity, Calm, and you've, you know, in terms of your own mental health experiences in your autobiography and your TV programme, Big Boys Don't Cry. It's a topic that you're very happy to talk about. You know, do you see yourself as being able to to be an ambassador for that and just speak up? Because, um, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of other rugby players that, that feel the same way. I never envisaged or my, my aim wasn't to be be an ambassador for it or be a voice for it. It was actually just selfishly helping me. Just being able to openly talk about it was was internally helping me to just normalise it for myself, to accept things for myself and understand it more for myself. And then, you know, other teammates were reaching out, both having played against and with, saying that they'd experienced the same feelings, the same things. Their wife had put them in contact with various people. And then it sort of became... Why can't we just talk? As soon as you start talking about mental health, it's like, oh, your mental health issues. And it's always like a negative connotation to it that you have mental health issues. But it's about understanding a bit more that it's mental health. It's the same way as your physical health. You know, you spoke earlier about you've hit 50 now and your eyes have started to go. Right, mm. that's part of your physical health. What can you do to then sort of fix that? Well, make yourself look like Harry Hill and there you go, jobs are good and you're sorted. But that's the sort of same approach that I think we need to start having more conversations. And we are definitely in rugby having more conversations. Boys are opening up a lot more. And I think the next step is actually like the tool acquisition of it all. How do you start a conversation? How do you recognise the signs in boys or your teammates that are struggling? They want to open up, but they can't open up. And just be that sort of ear that you can 
be there to listen to and ask the sort of right questions. We need to start having those tools because it's just everyone's going through the same things just at different levels and at different periods of their life. So it wasn't my aim to be that voice, but I'm happy that if it's helping people, then I'll run with it and I'll continue because selfishly, you know, say it like that, that it continues to help me to regularly check in with myself and work on things that I need to. Can we talk about your podcast, which actually has absolutely nothing to do with rugby, <laughs> everything but rugby. So what made you want to do it, to start it? How did it all kick off? I met Tom Fordyce and Steve Jones, who used to be at the BBC. And Tom was a big part of the Peter Crouch podcast. I met them in Japan. We got on really well. Then after the tournament, they'd left the BBC and set up their own podcast company. And they said, look, mate, would you be interested in setting up a podcast? And I went, hmm there's a hundred rugby podcasts mate like and i don't know what analytical in insight i can really bring to it and they're like no 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 we don't want to do rugby we want to set up a podcast where we just go and meet loads of different people loads of different stories loads of different jobs backgrounds and see where it runs and i was like go on then yeah that sounds like fun give us an insight who's been your best show who have you been like randomly gone to have a chat with that's really kind of perked your interest oh there's been a few there was a marine biologist called darren who came on and he was so well prepared and the facts that he came out with just blew our minds and then it, it goes from a psychopath expert that we had on or we had a woman that worked on death row for a good 10 years. So hearing those sort of stories. And then we had Paddy, a homeless guy who'd spent 10, 15 years homeless and trying to get a bit of perspective and understanding on what goes on in that world. Because we all live a very privileged life when you sit there and listen to his story and the, and the things he's been through. Um, and then to come out the other side, they were really big ones. And, they, and then there's also some fun, random ones that you get. Everyone's got a story if you ask the right questions. And it, it's just something I really enjoy doing and takes me away from the rugby bubble and keeps me a little bit fresher coming back into it. Do you know what I enjoyed watching recently? Trixie Turnover. <laughs> you made a very impressive drag queen. I thought you were amazing. i got to be honest. And the fact it, that you kept your beard. Yeah, the, well, it wasn't they that kept it. There was a big conversation. They were like, you're obviously getting rid of the beard. And I went, I haven't been clean shaven for 12 years. There's not a chance. I've got no chin. It looks like I've got a big face and, you know, this thing. You know, I've got the smallest P head going. I'm like, mate. I'm sorry, the beard's got to stay. And they were like, right, we'll just spray paint it with about a kilo of glitter then. In fact, there might still be some knocking about. You look like great fun. Yeah, you were really good. I thought Have you, really Lawrence, good. you never tried a bit of drag? No. Well, I mean, they just, I mean, they look at the size and go, mm, listen, we, we've got wardrobes, but not for people like you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we could talk to you, obviously, like most of our guests all day, um, but we'll move on to probably not your favourite subject now, Joe, actually, rugby. The Evening Standard Rugby Podcast with Lawrence Delalio, Supported by Fuller's London Pride, official beer of Premiership Rugby. We should definitely start with a mention to the Red Roses, who put on such a valiant display against the Black Ferns in that World Cup final. Um, they went down to 14 players after just 18 minutes, of course. But listen, they were brilliant. Awesome tournament. Awesome final. I suppose my question, Lawrence, to you, what words, I don't know, of advice would you have for the players after doing so well and then experiencing that? Well, it was heartbreaking. I've got up at six in the morning to watch it and uh, so did 1.8 other million people. So I think that regardless of the result the sort of momentum that's got behind women's rugby and you know the red roses etc they should be very proud of what they've achieved you know we've all lost big games of rugby sadly there's not a lot you can say in the early part of it it's quite raw the emotions I think if they keep 15 people on the field, I think they go on and win that game. You know, playing New Zealand in New Zealand, they took the game to Eden Park, they brought in Wayne Smith, they gave themselves every advantage they possibly could. I just felt for them, you know, I really did. So, but they should feel very proud, I think. Joe, you've been there. How tough is it to get through that? How long does that take? I actually watched the game. I had got in the Saturday morning. Bar bar's night out, isn't it? That's I, was sat, I was sat there with my kebab and a portion of chips and then the game came on and I was like brilliant so I watched it and I don't want to be pernickety but the I'm arguing that the last thing that New Zealand have thrown the jumper across and that I actually think it should be a penalty the other way but you know that's being pernickety it is heartbreaking for them I've been there and it, it does take a long time also at the end of, of our tournament 
there was a few questions posed to me. Mate, you still looked really quite happy. And and it was like, well, because I, I look back at the tournament and enjoyed it. Of course, I wanted the gold medal at the end of it. We all did. But the experience, the cultural experience, the unity of the group and the, and the memories we'd made along the way, you sort of have to take stock and appreciate. It's hard to do, especially like Lawrence said in, in the moment and as raw as it is. But I think women's rugby is in a really good place. And even go back to my daughter, she sees these games and she goes, hang on a minute, can I play rugby? Can I do that? And it, it's those moments that go, well, hang on, there's the next generation that can come through now because it's getting so much bigger and there's so many more characters in the game that are putting it out there and it's far more accessible. So I think in four years' time, we should throw the kitchen sink at it like New Zealand did in their own backyard and give it a good go. Evening Standard Rugby Podcast with Lawrence Delalio, supported by Fuller's London Pride, official beer of Premiership Rugby. Auto Internationals this weekend. We saw wins for Ireland against Fiji, Wales against Argentina, England against Japan. Lawrence. Can I just say, big up for the Northern Hemisphere rugby. Every team, apart from Scotland, they obviously didn't get the memo, won their games. And I think quite a few teams, Ireland and France last week. And when I first started playing against the, the Southern Hemisphere in the autumns, you know, across the board, England would win the odd game. Everyone else would get smashed to pieces. And I think now, as we go into a World Cup next year, I don't think the hemispheres have ever been closer than they are right now. Scotland nearly beat the All Blacks for the first time in their history. Ireland obviously doing great things. France winning a Again, and England, I thought they played very well. You know, you score 50 points against a team like Japan. You've you got to be quite happy with that. Positives, I think we've got a pack that are really coming together. You know, the front row looks very, very strong. I prefer second rows to stay in the second row. Don't like them in the back row, but that's just me. I thought the young lad at scrum half, I think there's a decision to be made this week. going to be very interesting. Does he go back to uh, Ben Young's or does he actually give Jack Van Porfley a real chance to play a slightly higher paced game, which I think you need to do against the All Blacks if you're going to win. And Freddie Stewart, I think, was a massive positive at fullback. But yeah, listen, I think we'll find out a little bit more about England uh, in the next couple of weeks because you've probably got to play your strongest available team. And it's going to be fascinating for Eddie because the best performances England have ever produced under Eddie Jones have had Owen Farrell at 10, Manu Tuolangi at 12 and Henry Slade at 13. So it's going to be fascinating. Does he go back to that particular selection or... Does he continue with Marcus at 10 and Owen at 12? And I'm still a little bit confused by all of that. I think they can exist on the same pitch, but I just think you've got to start getting a few combinations going before the World Cup. I know there's a lot of rugby next year, but I'd like to see our strongest possible team. But a lot to be positive about with England, I think. Nick, what did you make of the rugby action this weekend? Yeah, I thought England were very good. I thought David Ribbons had a really good debut. And what I liked about him and and his debut is, I think in a back five of balance, you always need somebody who's just going to smash rucks all day long and give you continuity. He just got in there and was just like, I'm just going to make a mess of the the ones where we don't have the ball if when I need to. And I'm going to give the team continuity and let the big beasts do their thing around that. And I think England really need that. Always look better when the ball is quick. I thought Van Portfleet was really good. He drove the pace. I don't really understand how Freddie Stewart is so calm under the high ball, but he was talking about having done a lot of work with sports psychologists at Leicester and England on that. And uh, he looks absolutely fantastic. And yeah, I mean, I know what Lawrence is saying about second rows in the second row and obviously, you know, with a nod to, to Marrow. England clearly keep saying that they need, they, they feel like they need three line-out jumpers. I understand the benefit of that as well. I do think Marrow be his best at lock, but obviously, you know, Courtney Laws is just a machine. I mean, how do you replace that? And I think they're doing pretty well there. In terms of Marcus Smith and Owen Farrell, I thought it's encouraging. Um, Obviously, it's just a much bigger challenge against New Zealand this weekend. Yeah, so Eddie's got some decisions to make there. Scotland almost pulling off a victory against the All Blacks in that brilliant France-South Africa game. The atmosphere looked insane in Marseille. And Italy, Joe, beating Australia. I mean, it's all kind of building up, isn't it? Quite nicely for the World Cup. The excitement levels are rising. What's your deal for the World Cup then? What's my deal? Is this like a semi-interview? Is there a big like um, evening standard or London Pride gig out there that you know is there there's no. stuff available or? I'm just asking because you said did you like like a couple of months ago you were like you know you wanted to have a conversation with Eddie about it but if not if the World Cup is not there for you that you were gonna like shut up shop. No, that was slightly misquoted. It was like I'd love to still be able to go and play at the next World Cup. I'd love to do that and give it one more crack. But 
as has been mentioned a couple of times by various different people, uh, they compare Eddie to Gareth Southgate occasionally on his selection and not picking on form, but picking on thingy. But when it comes to loose head, he very much is, is picking on form. I'm not in the conversation because I'm not playing well enough. You've got Genji, who's now vice captain and a huge influence on that pack and, and key to England's attack and his defence, his physicality, but key to that team. Mako's come back this season and, and in great form. And then you've got young, hungry, Bevan Rod and Val Rapava Ruskin, who you'd argue has been the form club loose head in the league and he's been in the squad but then you can be as good a club player as you want but you get into an inter international environment albeit a squad and sometimes you freeze or sometimes you, you it's not comfortable or you, you can't really put your best foot forward there like because sometimes it's a too big a step up but yeah you can argue that he might not be picking form on any other position, but he's certainly picking form in, in loose head. And I can't argue with that. And, you know, I recognise where I am and I'll just keep playing. And if the call does come one day that I can make the World Cup, then brilliant. I'll, I'll take it with both hands. But I also recognise I'm 32 and I might be better suited to um, going out there with the Evening Standard or London Pride. <laughs> But you won't be shutting up shop, is what my question is. No, there's no shutting up shop. No. Okay, that's good, that's good. Okay, let's move on to the Premiership games now. So Friday night, saw current champions Leicester take a trip down to the wreck to face Bath. Despite the home team being down 8.15, I think, at half-time, it was a try for Will Burton, the final moment of the game that saw them snatch a victory over the Tigers. Um, I really enjoyed that one. There's some more good news for Bath, Lawrence. Yeah, do you know what? It's been, um, I mean, they couldn't win a raffle last season, could they really? And now is that three wins on the bounce? And, and well done to them. It's fascinating. You know, we, we overanalyze the game of rugby sometimes and, and players sometimes get a little bit maybe blasé. You know, sometimes you take for granted what you've got. When you look at Bath's best performers in the last few weeks, the lads who have come across from Worcester, Ollie Lawrence and Ted Hill and Shilcott at fullback, they were probably the best three players on the field on uh, Friday night. And they haven't taken for granted what they've got because they're so lucky. They feel very lucky to have a contract. And the game is quite emotional sometimes. And I think when you bring that level of emotion, you can really Im improve a performance. So, yeah, I think it's good things happening at Bath. I mean, what a finish, by the way, from the young lad on the wing. But, I mean, what a finish. I mean, I could only dream of that, really. But it, I just thought it was great. And as much as I am impartial, and I love to be impartial, I mean, it's nice when Leicester get beat in the last minute of the game as well. And it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> You're I mean, a nasty piece of work, you are. <laughs> I, am. I mean, they would say the same, really. Um, mm. I mean, yeah, they did call me the Antichrist, actually, at Leicester, to be honest with you. <laughs> Maybe that was only one or two of them. But no, listen, I just thought it was great for them to, and it just shows how competitive this league is. Joe, if Leicester's the team that, that Lol enjoyed beating most, who's the team that you enjoy beating most? You already know the answer. Just such a leading question. That's probably Saracens or something like that, I would say, probably. The only thing with Saris is that it's mainly because it's such a rarity that we beat them that that's probably why I like it the most. Unbelievable at the moment, aren't they? They're, 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 they're absolutely on fire, mate. They've The previous squad players have, have now turned into shoe-ins for the first team and they have really started to step up and there's also reaping the fact that there's some overlooked England quality players that are just going to town in the premiership still so like Ben L's completely on fire and um, and good on him that that was so painful to say good on them oh <laughs> god oh god open the window joe take a minute while nick oh goes. god <laughs> And that's the thing though Nick isn't it they never know when they're beaten like 20 minutes ago this weekend Northampton had what 22 point leads looking like they were going to yeah. be the ones to break Sarri's record but they still fall back it's that calmness under pressure isn't it just knowing that it, if you, you know refusing to accept that it's it's ever done but sticking to I suppose I guess sticking to processes and sticking to the plans and knowing that you've got that in there to you know to get it over the line and uh, good on people like Alex Lozowski like um, Joe was talking about England quality overlook guys and yeah like you said Ben Earl he's another absolute uh, monster and uh, I, I think surely he's going to come back into the Indian picture at some point. Okay, two more quick games to get through then. Um, another upset in the West Country, Josh Gibbons and men. They suffered at the hands of Newcastle. They pulled off a win at Kingston, 27 points to 21. But Lawrence, all things considered, Josh Gibbons just must be scratching his head after oh, that. Oh, he must be very frustrated. I mean, they were playing at home as well. I mean, I know they're missing Adam Hastings and uh, Chris Harris, who have been big sort of um, leaders for them this season and a number of other players. But you would have expected that, you know, the result to go their way. 
I guess I would say sometimes if you give Anesha Saracens, of course, if you give yourself a bit of too much to do, I think Newcastle were out sight by half time and I think Gloucester came back into the game at the second half, but they give themselves too much to do, really. Yeah, and then the other result of the weekend is Exeter beating London Irish 22 points to 17. Well, should we do our outstanding player then? Outstanding. Supported by Fuller's London Pride. Lawrence, you can go first this week. Who's your outstanding player? But I did watch the internationals and I think we, you know, being sort of a, a little bit Italian myself, I, I think we go with Capuzzo, the fullback. I just think he scored two tries against Australia and he's such a cracking player. Ange Capuzzo. I mean, that's a name, isn't it? So I'm going to go with him. I think for Italy to beat a team like Australia, I think it's just brilliant for Italian rugby. We we give them a, a really hard time, all of us do, saying, oh, you know, should they, shouldn't they be involved? But I think they deserve it. And he was outstanding at the weekend. So we go with Capuzzo, the fullback. Joe? I'm also going to go with an Italian. Tommaso Allen was fantastic on the ball, the way he was playing. He was awful with the boot. I mean, they could have been well clear of Australia for a long period of time, but I'm giving it to him. Because he was so poor off the tee, he enabled the drama to go all the way down to the wire. And they relied on the Australian guy. The well, He was the guy who was on debut as well, wasn't he? the lad that came on for the kick. And he the kick. Why, why does he like being called Tommy Allen and not Tommaso? Because I call him Tommaso and everyone keeps correcting me in my ear saying, no, he, I said Tommy Allen sounds like an American name. I mean, I was like... No, I've, I've had it from the horse's mouth. I said, what do you want me to call you? And he says, Tommaso. So whoever you're talking to, Lo, Lo is wrong. It's Tommaso. <laughs> he wants Tommaso. Yeah, I've got it. Keep going with Tommaso. Christ, Tommaso. It sounds fantastic, actually. Exactly. <laughs> um, Nick? Obvious, but I say Freddie Stewart. I just think for someone who's got 15 caps to be so in control in you know such a difficult position in so, for so many reasons and he's 21 to have so much influence on that team already from the back of the back line you know he was saying that he watched the World Cup semi-final at the Students Union basically so to have gone from there to here and this time that's often I'm going to go with either Ted Hill mainly for the reasons that Lawrence spoke about the impact I think that he's had as well as Ollie Lawrence and the Worcester boys on Bath have been impressive or maybe to Lupe Falatel actually I thought he was really good for Wales as well especially they were under so much pressure going into to this game against Argentina so yeah two for me for what it's worth right next weekend is the Premiership Cup that's in action but round 11 of the Premiership returns the following week so we'll hold off on any match predictions this week however England face New Zealand at Twickenham Joe what do you think England need to do to try and pull off a victory against the All Blacks? Well, as Lowell mentioned earlier, like the pack is really starting to fire up. I like the fact that they've got at least four or five carriers, like genuine out and out ball carriers in there now. It's just with the New Zealand team, you've got to get that balance between having those four or five carriers actually recognising that they need to do their graft and their work about the breakdown because that will be the key between the two teams. And I'm really excited. There's there's always trying to pick like heads-to-heads with players. And I like the sound of Genji going at RD Sevilla and vice versa because they're both in-your-face characters, big ball carriers, big hitters. I'm excited to see that. I'm going to go for an England win by two. Okay, brave. Um, the other games this weekend, Wales take on Georgia, Scotland will face Argentina, Italy will host South Africa, Ireland, they're going to be up against Australia and France will be playing against Japan. And of course, we'll bring you all the results and chat in next week's pod. So Joe, it's time for a few more questions and then you are done. Right, you're going to get tackled now by Lawrence Delalio. Tackled. Supported by Fuller's London Pride. Your full name, please, sir. Joseph William George Marler. Wow, well, that's very I'm posh. Tr- I'm trying to change it at the minute. What are you trying to change it to? I'm try- trying to change it to Joseph, J O S E F, Maller, M A L A. But uh, don't worry about that. Well, that's another story. Favourite takeaway? Chinese. The walk in from Lawton does the best Chinese in the world. It's phenomenal. Beautiful. Did you have a celebrity crush? My celebrity crush, I really liked uh, Rachel from Friends. Good choice. Uh, what was the last movie you watched? Uh, Red Dragon. I think it's a prequel, but it came out after Silence of the Lambs. Anthony Hopkins, Ralph Fiennes. Oh, it's dark. Love it. Good stuff. <laughs> and listen, when it probably changes every day, but what do you have for breakfast? Coffee. Yeah, I live miles away, don't I? So I'm up at five and I can't be asked to Please. make anything. So I'll just grab a coffee, get on the road, and that'll be my breakfast. Do you have a nickname? Do the lads call you something? Croissant, because my nose is bent like a 
like the French <laughs> pastry, so they just call me croissant. <laughs> now, what is the best advice that you've ever been given, either on the field or off it? This too shall pass. Whether you're at the highest height of, of whatever you're doing in your life, just remember, this too shall pass. And when you're at the lowest low of whatever you're doing in your life, this too shall pass. And that time is your ally. And that's something that I'm trying really hard to sort of accept and understand a bit more. Good advice. Who would you say is the most famous person in your phone book? If your kids sort of went to scroll through your address book and they went, Daddy, I didn't know you knew so and so, who, who, who's that person? Uh, Jonathan Ross. I went to his Halloween party the other week. Did uh, you? What was that like? Just another level of surrealness the characters there and the goings on i was very much out of my depth but um, <laughs> it was definitely an experience what did you go as i went as captain spaulding he's a dark sadistic clown from a house of a thousand corpses oh, sounds nice i wouldn't say you're right <laughs> you were, you were right now talking to which who would play uh, you in a film about your life his name's tony way and he's Lenny from Afterlife. He's like the one that Ricky Gervais always grabs oh, yes. the rolls on the back of his head. Yep. He was also the fool in Game of Thrones. I think he'd make a good me. Now, we know that you're a funny person, but who's the funniest person that you know? Coley really, really makes me like belly chuckle. I mean, he has got a face that you can laugh at just by looking Where at he just but Like anything he does, like he makes me belly chuckle. And it's like he's most of it's unintentional. He's just <laughs> it's ridiculous human. Dan Cole, are you a dog or a cat person? Do you have a dog or a cat, or do you have both? Got two dogs. I had a cat growing up called Blossom, but um, always wanted a dog. And finally, I've uh, I've got two dogs: a black lab and a cavapoo called Bean Juanito. <laughs> <laughs> do you like use its full name when you're calling it in the park? Yeah, and it still doesn't work because even if I shorten it, he's 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 quite a thick lad. Do you shorten it to to Bean? Bean? Okay. Now moving on, what is your karaoke song? If you have to get up and do a little song in front or a duet, what's your go-to? Adele, someone like you. Straight in. So are you happy with that? Yeah, I'm happy with that. I just wouldn't have had him down as that as that kind of song, Joe. What? <laughs> uh, what's your favourite TV show, Joe? Afterlife, the series is just wonderful, but I'm a stickler for I'm a celeb at the minute. Can't get enough of it. Oh, tins, eh? How about that? Oh, mate, <laughs> it's even better when you semi know someone on it, and uh, it's great to watch. Which superhero would you most like to be? Spider Man, yeah, only perfect. because my my kids, my two sons, would be most impressed by that. Who do you look at as the best rugby player of all time? Who was the person that you really looked up to? I really enjoyed Brad Thorne. Just love the way he went about things. Yeah, I mean, Jason Leonard, obviously, for in my own position, but Brad Thorne was someone that I really enjoyed. I like that answer. Now, I think I know the answer to this question. Your proudest premiership moment? The proudest premiership moment was 2021. The way it went from Guzzy getting the chop in December, things all over the place at the club, um, the boys pulling together and then backs against the wall, just jouing, or as we say, juve rather than jouet, because our captain at the time couldn't quite understand. We did a big speech. He did get huddled before one of the games and we'd be talking about jouet, jouet, let's just jouet, jouet. And he, Stefan, really thick Afrikaans, as in thick accented, um, we all the thing, big moment. And then just before we went out, he was got us in a huddle and he was like, Yes, guys, let's just go out and juve, hey? And we were like, everyone looking around the soccer camp. Juve? What? And he went, What? What what did I say? Oh, sorry, Duve. Let's go out and Duve. And we we're like, that's not it either, mate. Juve. He was like, Oh, I don't know. Just go out and play, hey. Let's go out and play. So yeah, 2021 and and seeing the boys enjoy it as much as the young boys enjoy the following three or four days was something that I'll always be proud of. Well, listen, Joe, thank you for being our guest this week. Uh, I've got a feeling that you might be doing a bit more Juve as you're fourth in the Premiership <laughs> at the moment. And, uh, good luck, with, you, uh, good luck with, with the rest of the season. And um, yeah, keep that phone on because you never know with that pecking order that might all change. No, my phone will be on, but I've got plenty lined up already. We're actually taking the podcast on a live tour next year in April. We're doing Glasgow, Birmingham, Manchester. And actually, we've somehow managed to bag the London Palladium, Whoa. of which I walked past during this week. And 
I had to double check. I rang the podcast crew and was like, are you sure there's not another Palladium? It's this Palladium because they've got this big wall of people that have all done it and it's got the two Ronnies and all these different. And I'm like, I'm not sure like this is going to go well. And they were like, no, we've definitely got it. We just need people to buy tickets now. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> I will have my phone on, Lawrence, but I've got plenty to keep me busy for now. Well, I'm sure we'll be advertising that, Nick, in the evening standard, won't we? Um, oh, delightful. Absolutely. 100%. Thank you, Nick. Yes, Nick. You're what a lovely, handy networking podcast this is. Wonderful. Glad you come on now. Are you? <laughs> Thanks for having me, guys. So that's all then for this episode of This Evening Standard Rugby Podcast supported by Fuller's London Pride. Don't forget, you can watch the full video episode with all the extra bits at londonpridebeer.co.uk. And we'll be back next week. Uh, Until then, thanks for listening. If you want to listen to a rugby podcast, it's obviously ours. If you want to listen to a non-rugby podcast, then it's Joe Marler's. (laughs) The Evening Standard Rugby Podcast with Lawrence Delalio. Supported by Fuller's London Pride, official beer of Premiership Rugby. Support with pride.